I'm Joshua Bardwell, and this is episode 5 in my video series, Black Box 101, where I teach you how to use Black Box to tune and troubleshoot your quadcopter. If you haven't watched the earlier episodes in the series, I suggest you check out the playlist down in the video description. Uh, diving in right in the middle is probably going to leave you more confused than you started. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the P term. I discussed in a previous episode, from a sort of academic sense, what the P term does. Now we're going to look at some real world flight examples. And I've got something pretty exciting for you guys. I went out and I flew with the P term at 20, and then 30, and then 40, and then 50, and so on and so on and so on. I generated flights at each of those uh, gains so that you could see what the effect of raising and lowering the P term is. And we're going to look at it here in black box. But we're also going to look at it, I'm going to do a separate video series over in my practical PID tuning playlist uh, where we look at the actual, you know, one of them is tuning with black box, the other one is tuning just by looking at the camera. So we're going to look at it from both directions. I think it's going to generate some really interesting content. But in this one, we're going to look at black box and we're going to see how the P term does what it does and what the P term looks like when it's low, good, and high. Let's get into it. So I've opened up the log and I have synced the video with the log and the previous video in this series showed you how to sync the video with the log. Uh, so we'll skip over that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the graphs for, for what I want to see in this particular session. And what I want to show you in this particular session is I want to show you RC command. And you know what we should do to keep this simple and understandable is we should look at just one axis at a time. So let's look at the roll axis. Let's look at the gyro on the roll axis. And let's look at just the P term on the roll axis. Okay, so we're going to do that and I'm going to save that and I'm going to get a single graph here. And we can do the same thing if we want to for pitch as well. Let's add a custom graph with RC command pitch and the gyro on pitch and the P term on pitch. There we go. So now that we've got the graph set up the way we want them, we're going to go ahead and take a look at what the P term does while we're flying. Before we do that, let's just check and remind ourselves what the P gain was for this flight. And there's a very easy way to do that. This icon up here, the info icon, it says view slash hide header. If we click this, we can see a dump of what the configuration options were for the copter at the time that the flight started. So if you use in-flight adjustments to adjust your PIDs, for example, while you're flying, this won't change. You will see a notification of that in the log. We'll see that at some future time, I'm sure. But if you just want to remind yourself what the settings were for the copter at the time that you flew, Here's the way to do it. This is a really great feature. I think it was added in Betaflight 2.9 maybe, maybe even a little earlier than that. Before that, it was a real hassle <laughs> to know what your PIDs, you had to manually do a config dump basically, and then you had to find some way of associating that with the file. It was a real hassle. Here we can see that the P gains for roll and pitch are 5.0. Notice that this still shows the old style PIDs well, in Betaflight, of course, we would have 50, not 5.0. Just a little bit of a scaling issue there. But we, the, the, PIDs, the P gains were 50, the yaw gains were 4, and here we can see what the I and the D gains were. You can see here for this test that I've set the D gains to 0. I've completely zeroed out the D term as if it didn't exist because I want you to be able to focus on what the P term is doing. The I term is at sort of it's close to default values, if not the exact default values. And the P gain is in, it's pretty close to defaults as well, but not exactly at the defaults. I just wanted to use round numbers is why I did that. So let's just play forward. I'm going to hit the space bar to start playing and we'll see if we find something interesting. I can watch the sticks in the upper right. I like to, this craft display here with the motors, I like to turn that off unless I'm specifically troubleshooting something to do with the motors. And here comes a big sweeping turn. So let's take a look at what the P term does during this turn. And we're looking at the roll axis mostly. So what we'll see is that the roll stick is going to go to the right. Let's just play this forward at like, say, 25% speed. The roll stick is going to go to the right. 
we're going to see RC command on the roll axis become positive. And I want you to think of that as pushing the copter to roll right or pushing to the right. When RC command goes positive, we are pushing the copter to roll right. How do you know it's roll right, not roll left? Well, if you're good, you can memorize it, or you can just look at the stick right here, and you can see that as this goes positive, the stick is pushing to the right. So positive means right, and therefore by you know negative means left, right? So RC command is saying, go to the right. What does the gyro do, and what does the P term do? What we should see is that the P term also goes positive and begins pushing the copter to roll to the right. Now, the P term is having some very subtle action here. Uh, it, we can see right here we get a little bit of a positive P term, also pushing the copter to roll right. But then we also see a little bit of a negative P term here. And I want you to think of that as accelerating and decelerating the copter into the roll. So we're, we're speeding up the roll and slowing down the roll. Okay, it's, about, it's all about roll rate in acro mode not absolute position or anything like that. So when the P term goes positive, it's saying roll a little bit faster. And when the P term goes negative, it's saying roll a little bit slower. You're going a little too fast, okay? And what we see though, and so it can be hard to, it can be hard to interpret that what the P term is doing because if the P term is, ne is zero, it's saying the copter is rolling at the correct rate. Well, you would think that the P term being zero would mean that the copter was stationary, and that is not true. And that can be a little bit confusing until you get used to, to thinking in terms of roll rate, not in terms of absolute position. So right here, if we zoom in, we can see, well, I don't zoom in very much, but you can see that the P term crosses the axis from positive to negative and goes to zero. And what that means is that the copter was moving at the correct rate. The copter does not stop moving, it's moving at the correct rate. And then it was moving a little too fast and that's why the P term went negative. We're trying to hit the targeted angular rate. And in fact, if we look right here, we can see the commanded degrees per second is we're commanding 14 degrees per second of right, of right roll. And we can see what the gyro is doing 13 degrees per second of right roll. So we, what we generally wanna see that the gyro and RC command are very close together. We want to see that the commanded rate and the actual rate are the same, and therefore error is low. And that is, of course, as we discussed way back in the beginning, exactly what a PID controller is trying to do, is reduce error to zero. So we can kind of look at the gyro and the roll, and unfortunately they're not scaled in such a way that I don't think, they didn't used to be, and I'm not, I don't think it's been changed. They're not scaled in such a way that they will perfectly o overlay each other when things are correct. So it would be really nice if when the roll rate was the same, they perfectly overlaid each other. I don't think that they do, uh, at least they didn't used to. We can see here that the P term is relatively close to zero during this section. It's going a little bit negative, but generally it's close to zero. And in an ideal situation, you would see the P term being very low, very close to zero, almost all of the time. What that would mean is that there was very little error. And when there's very little error, that means that the gyro is doing exactly what it's commanded to do and the copter is flying perfectly. Anytime you see the P term becoming non-zero, it means that there's error that the, P, that the PID controller is trying to correct. Now that's not inherently a problem. There's always going to be error in a real world system. If we could design a real world system without error, we wouldn't need PID controllers at all. They would just do what it was commanded to do. That's why we have the PID controller. So the fact that there's error is not inherently a problem. What we want to do is look at how closely the gyro and RC command are tracking each other and see you know, whether the copter is doing what it's commanded to do. So as we go into the right roll, RC command goes positive, the gyro goes positive, the copter rolls right. Now here we start to get some oscillations and we can see, number one, we can see, well, let's watch the oscillations, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. I know there's oscillations, well, you watch the oscillations. Boom, 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 boom. There's those oscillations there. Those are prop wash oscillations. Anytime the copter is sort of turning into its own prop wash, you're gonna get those. Let's watch it at 100% speed. All right, there's the oscillations. So the first thing we can do whenever we see the gyro doing something that might be suspicious or unintended 
is we're going to look at RC command and we're going to see if it is in fact unintended and and not what we're being commanded to do because sometimes you know you, like the copter will yaw left unexpectedly you go oh what's wrong with my pids but actually it turns out when you look at the rc command you bump the stick by accident as you move the throttle so we always want to look at rc command to see if the gyro is being commanded to do the thing that we think it's not supposed to be doing and we can see here the rc command line is perfectly smooth so we did not command these oscillations my fingers were not jittering um and we can see then that the gyro and the p-term are moving opposite of each other. So as the gyro moves positive, the p-term moves negative and tries to counteract the unintended oscillation, the unintended movement, right? And that's what I said we would see for externally induced motion in uh, the previous video where we talked about the p-term. So, so here... RC command is perfectly smooth, the gyro is reporting that oscillation is happening, and the p-term is attempting to counteract the oscillation. Now we can see from the fact that we see the oscillation in the, the, uh, in the camera that the, the p-term is not doing a perfect job, right? It's not perfectly counteracting the oscillation. If it were perfectly counteracting the oscillation, then the gyro movement would be much smaller. We're going to look at some other examples of what higher and lower P gain look like, and we can see you know, how the situation changes as the gain changes. And if we continue to watch the gyro, we can see that the oscillation eventually settles out and stops happening. Now let's watch that in real time so you can just get a perspective on what that looks like. Now that's a great example of why video footage is so necessary when doing the pit analysis, because this might look like, oh my gosh, look at these oscillations. But in fact, when you watch it and when you listen to it, it's really not that bad, right? It's a pretty subtle oscillation. Now we're gonna look at another example of an oscillation and here I'm just gonna play it forward and show it to you. There it was. And that is a pretty classic, uh, that's prop wash oscillation for sure, but it's also getting to be what I would call a pretty classic example of P-term oscillation. So what I want you to see here, look at the yellow line where the P-term is. Let's look, for example, at this oscillation first. And I want you to see, uh, see how kind of irregular this oscillation is. The P-term is sort of fighting the gyro, but it, it's got this irregular quality. Now I want you to compare that to this oscillation here. Do you see that this oscillation looks almost like a pure sine wave, right? It's very smooth and very regular, okay? What's happening here is that the, the, uh, the PID controller is running up against the physical constraints of the system, the system being the quadcopter, right? It, it can only, the motors can only change speed so fast. And so if you were to ask the PID controller to shake the copter as, as fast as it could. It could only reach a certain frequency. And what we would see is something like this. We, instead of having these irregular oscillations where it speeds up and smooths down, we would get these sinusoidal oscillations where it is, it's, it's oscillating just as fast as it can. Well, this, this is probably not actually as fast as it could oscillate, but it's starting to get to the limits of the physical ability of the system to change speed and the oscillations smooth out. When you see very smooth oscillations like this in the P-term, that is a classic sign of either excess P-gain or not enough D-gain. Now, whether that's something that you actually decide you're gonna tune out will depend on many factors. For one thing, look at the video, right? Just watch it, and sometimes it's not as bad as it looks. Now that one, I would probably try and tune that out. I would for sure try and tune that out on a freestyle copter where I would like to get as smooth a footage as possible. And even on a racing copter, I would say that, that I, f I feel like this copter can probably do better than that, even on a racing copter where some amount of oscillation may be acceptable in exchange for a sharper tune or, or more precisely controllable copter. Next, we're gonna take a look at a flip and a roll and see what the P-term does during the flip and the roll. And I'm going to play this at, I think I'm going to play it at like 25% speed. Just so you can, it goes by pretty quick if I don't. Throttle raised, chop the throttle, push in, and stop. Now we can, we can see that there's a little bit of sync, I think, issue. Uh, that's pretty close, actually. No, I take it back. It seems like it synced pretty good. So let's take a look at what the P-term does here. 
As I begin to push left into the roll, RC command goes negative. So RC command is indicating that the copter should be rolling left. And we can see that the P term begins to go negative, telling the copter that it needs to accelerate into a left roll. Roll left faster is how you need to think of the P term going negative. Roll left faster. The gyro begins to go negative, indicating that the copter is rolling left faster. And the more negative the gyro is, the faster it is rolling to the left, not the more left it is rolled. It's not about position, but about rate. And we can see here, if we look at the gyro, we're at negative 83 degrees per second. And as we continue to move forward, the gyro begins rolling faster and faster and so forth. Notice that the commanded roll rate doesn't quite match the actual roll rate, especially at the beginning. The copter takes some time to accelerate to the commanded roll rate. So here at the very beginning of the roll, we're commanding negative 52 degrees per second, but the gyro is only at negative 18 degrees per second. And as the P term continues to be negative, we see that it eventually catches up. See now, now notice that the roll rate has exceeded the commanded rate. You see we're commanding 393 degrees per second, but we're, we're rolling at for negative 456 degrees per second. So what's gonna happen next, and we can see it right here, is that the P term will turn around. The P term will say, whoa, whoa, you're accelerating too fast. No, no, slow down. And it might seem counterintuitive in something dramatic like a snap roll that we would ever tell the copter to slow down. But I assure you, if you've ever seen a copter really flip out, they can roll way faster than you want them to roll. So the P term is trying to sort of keep this all in check and what we see is that at the beginning, the gyro lags behind the, what it's being commanded to do. And then the P term aggressively pushes the copter into the move until the gyro exceeds the commanded rate, at which point the P term goes positive. So now notice that RC command is negative, indicating a commanded left roll. The gyro is negative, indicating that a left roll is actually occurring. But the P term is positive, indicating that the p-term is pushing the copter to roll to the right, or to put it more precisely, roll slower to the left, okay? So instead of pushing the copter to accelerate into the left roll, it's now pushing it to decelerate out of it. And if the p-term continued to be positive, eventually the copter would be rolling to the right instead of the left. So if we decelerate long enough and if we continue to apply that force, we'll eventually be moving the opposite direction, right? But at this point, the positive P term is simply saying, slow down, slow your roll. Huh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> slow your roll. We can see the next thing the P term does though is it goes back to being negative. So in other words, the P term said, whoa, slow down. You're going too fast. And then it said, no, I changed my mind, speed up again. Uh, you slowed down too much. So we can see here that on these very, very aggressive moves, the P term is, is struggling with the, again, the physical limitations of the system. The motors can only accelerate and decelerate so fast. And there's a certain amount of latency between what the gyro puts out and what the motors actually do. So the P term is struggling to sort of manage that. Uh, and we see here that says, no, now you need to speed up, go faster. But the net result is not terrible. We can see that we, we reach this commanded rate. And the commanded rate is relatively consistent. Looks like it's a negative 500. Is that degrees per second? I don't think that's right. Did I not? Oh, I'm not at full deflection. I guess, I guess so. Negative 500. Huh. Okay, I've just noticed something. I've been saying degrees per second up here, but actually that's not right because I know what my rates are. My rates at full stick deflection are, I think, 1033 degrees per second, and this is only reading 500. So this is clearly not degrees per second. I don't actually know what it is, but I will tell you this. If you go to View Preferences and you choose Display Actual Units on Stick Display and Display Actual Units on Legend, then you will get the actual degrees per second. There we go. And that is actually what I would prefer to have. So uh, everything I've said up till now has been 100% accurate, except that the numbers I've been reading have not been degrees per second. Okay, now they are degrees per second, and we'll continue forward with that. Anyway, we can see that the commanded rate, is, I'm at full stick deflection here, so the commanded rate is basically 1033 degrees per second throughout the whole roll. And if we look at the gyro, we can see what actually happens. We can see we briefly exceed that, 
hitting uh, 1299 degrees per second, but then the p-term basically gets things under control. And if we continue to look at the gyro value here, we can see it hovers around pretty actually pretty precisely around the commanded rate of 1033 degrees per second for the entire roll. And that's a very common thing to see on abrupt moves like this, to see a strong push into the move. Go faster, get moving, buddy, get moving. Oh, oh, wait, I overshot. Oh, sorry, slow down. And then after that initial sort of rebound to sort of settle in, notice here in the middle of the move, the P-term is close to zero. It's close to the zero line, meaning that error is low and meaning that the copter is moving at close to the targeted rate. Now we'll go in and we'll look at the end of the move next. We can see we've got some oscillation here at the end of the move, haven't we? P-term oscillation, a very smooth and sinusoidal if we look at the magnitude, we can see that the magnitude, which is the, the uh, distance from the zero line, we can see that the magnitude is larger than the magnitude of those little oscillations we saw earlier. So the copter is shaking more aggressively. But what we should find is that the frequency of the oscillation, the frequency of P-term oscillations for a given copter should be relatively consistent because the frequency is a function of the physical limitation of the system like I talked about. I'll show you a little tip for finding the frequency. If I press the M key, I can set a marker. I'm going to press the M key. With that, let me just clear it. Get right at the top. In fact, let me zoom in a little even. If I get right at the top of this oscillation and hit the M key, uh, ooh, maybe it'd be even better to do the zero crossing. Yes, that would be better. So I'm going to go right to the point where the, uh, the P term crosses the line and hit the M key. And then I'm going to move one full wavelength to the next zero crossing. And you can actually see the frequency of nine hertz. So this copter seems to be oscillating at a frequency of nine hertz when we have P-term oscillation. And if I go back and look at a previous oscillation, I should see that it's a similar frequency. P-term oscillations are usually at a fixed frequency or close to it for a given copter. We'll do that a little later. So we've got these oscillations at the end of the move uh, as the copter tries to come to an abrupt halt. And again, if we watch in slow-mo, we see that the copter does the roll. Oh, it's having some trouble playing back at speed. Let's try that again, shall we? Yeah, it's having, <laughs> let me take this other, oh, it's cause I'm zoomed in. Let me zoom out just a little. Maybe that'll make it easier. Zoom in, zoom, it's cause I'm, let me zoom in a little. Here we go. No, my computer's still not happy. Just out of curiosity, let's go back and let's check out an earlier example of some oscillations. So this is not the flip or roll. And let's just check the frequency of those oscillations to see if my claim about the oscillations, the P-term oscillations being relatively fixed frequency is correct. So I'm going to zoom in and I'm gonna find the point where it crosses the zero axis. I'm gonna hit the M key to mark, and then I'm gonna go one full wavelength and 13 hertz. Well, there you go. <laughs> Let's do two wavelengths. 13. Right here. Let's mark this one. 13. Looks like this oscillation is a pretty consistent 13 hertz. Oh, that one's shorter though, 13 hertz. Well, this oscillation here is a pretty consistent 13 hertz. Uh, looks like the oscillation here was a little different. Well, there you go, we'll learn something new every day. Okay, so to sum up what we've looked at here, we can look at what the RC command is commanding and what the gyro is actually doing, and we can compare them and we can watch the way in which the P term is, is pushing, either pushing in the same direction as RC command to accelerate the move or is pushing in the opposite direction to decelerate the move or to slow down the move. We can also look for this type of P-term oscillation which will manifest as a smooth sinusoidal oscillation that is pretty much always gonna be excess P gain. But excess is relative because some amount of oscillation may be acceptable. And, and most copters are gonna have some amount of oscillation unless they're just flying really, really soft. It, it's almost to the point now where the amount of oscillation you want to tolerate is subjective. Uh, it used to be that if you raised P-term too high, you'd very quickly hit a point where the copter became sort of unflyable. It sort of was hard to control because the oscillations were so bad. 
But modern firmwares like Betaflight and Raceflight and probably CleanFlight, I haven't flown CleanFlight in a very long time, but they've just gotten better and better in their ability to manage this type of oscillation. And so these days, you seldom will see a copter that is unflyable p-term oscillations unless you've really just raised the p-term out of control. And I have some examples of that, but I think we've gone long enough in this video and we'll continue to look at the p-term in a little more detail in the upcoming videos. We'll look at what a low and a high p-term looks like. I would say this video with a p-gain of about five, this p-term is at about a good level. Maybe it could be a little higher or a little lower, but it's not you know, objectively bad. Remember though that we've got no D gain in here. The D gain is zero. And that means that these oscillations are worse than they otherwise would be if we were flying with some D gain. And of course, in a future video, we'll look at the effect of adding the D gain in. But that's going to be all for now. Hope this has been educational. And as always, happy flying.